The first year of marriage has a reputation for being the hardest. In the case of Josh Fulgham and Heather Strong, it wasn't difficult. It was catastrophic. Just 11 days after their wedding, Josh was jailed for pointing a gun at his new bride and threatening to shoot her. The honeymoon was over, and things only got worse from there. In this case, the marriage vow, till death do us part, took on a grave meaning. Before we begin, we would like to extend our deepest sympathies to the family and loved ones of the victim in this case, Heather Strong. This case takes place in Marion County, a North Central Florida community. That's where Josh Fulgham and Heather Strong called home. He was 27, she 26. Their relationship had spanned a decade, more than a third of their lives. It was a roller coaster ride shadowed by violent outbursts and infidelity. There were breakups followed by makeups. Despite their problems, the pair couldn't seem to sever the bonds that tied them. Part of their connection was the two children they shared, an eight-year-old girl and a two-year-old boy. Before this tragedy reached a point of no return, there was a time when it seemed like Josh and Heather were finally going to break away from each other for good. Josh had been dating a woman named Amelia Carr off and on for about two years. When the 24-year-old single mother of three got pregnant with Josh's child, he asked her to marry him, but their engagement was short-lived. Following an argument with Amelia, Josh withdrew his proposal. He took the ring back and married Heather instead. Heather and Josh tied the knot on December 26, 2008, but making their union official didn't dissolve the tensions that simmered between them. On the evening of January 5th, Josh demanded that Heather give him her ex-boyfriend's phone number. When she refused, he pointed a shotgun at her and threatened, you're going to give me the number or the shooting starts here and then I go to Ben's. Josh was arrested the next day. In a phone call Josh made to Heather from the jail, he talked about his predicament. Hello? Hi. Please don't hang up. I'm not. I don't want to do this. Josh, because I can't, you promised me, you promised me I can't live like this. Well, are you going to push this or what? Mm -hmm. huh? You're not going to do that, Josh. You're going to kill me when you get out of there. I have. Josh was in jail fuming for a month. The anger he felt for Heather reporting him to the police intensified. Meanwhile, Heather was moving on. Just three days after Josh was arrested, she started living with another man named Jamie Acom. Jamie was no stranger to Amelia. They had known each other since Amelia was 15 years old and they had once been in a relationship as well. Jamie had fathered one of Amelia's three children. He was also the person who introduced Amelia to Josh and Heather. Despite all the back and forth between Heather, Josh, Amelia, and Jamie, and the tensions it spawned, the four of them still hung out sometimes. The two women even babysat for each other's children occasionally. Amelia described their complicated relationships to Marion County Detective Donald Bowie after Heather went missing. I hope and pray that you know nothing. I think someone I that you need to speak friend. a little bit more to would probably be Jamie Acom because you mentioned the triangle with me, Josh, and Heather, but it's more of a square because Jamie's got a lot of anger and animosity towards both me and Josh for multiple reasons. Listen to me. Listen to me. I understand, but listen to me. Put yourself in my position. Oh, I'm trying to. Josh is telling everybody that he was the last person with her. Okay, why would he say that if he had hurt her? After Josh was arrested for pointing a shotgun at Heather, Amelia did what she could to get him out of jail. She made calls on his behalf and lent him $1,700 towards his $5,000 legal bill. He was released after 31 days. Josh could be convincing where Heather was concerned, and he persuaded her to retract her statements to police that led to his aggravated domestic assault charge. Just one week after signing that paperwork, 
Heather disappeared. The last time anyone heard from Heather was on February 15th. That day, she took a call from Josh while working her shift at the Iron Skillet, a restaurant located in a local Petro station. Co-workers noticed that she was visibly upset after the call. Josh told Heather that he was seizing custody of their two children immediately because of information he found out about Jamie Acom. The next morning, on February the 16th, Heather didn't show up for the morning shift. That wasn't customary for her. According to the manager, she had always been reliable and a responsible employee. Heather's cousin in Mississippi, Misty Strong, was worried as well. Typically, Misty communicated with Heather daily by phone or email. Josh told everyone who inquired that Heather had gone to Mississippi, but Misty had not heard from her, and neither had her mother. Misty filed a missing person report on February the 24th. Police opened an investigation. At first, Heather's status was listed as missing, but as the detectives began asking questions, that was escalated to missing and endangered on March the 18th. Detectives spoke to the Iron Skillet's bookkeeper and found out that Heather's bank card, which was tied to her paycheck deposits, had been used several times from the 16th until the 19th when the funds ran dry. They pulled security footage and spotted someone using Heather's card. Of course, it was not Heather. The person wore what appeared to be a leaf blower. They knew Josh was employed by a landscape maintenance company. Josh had a history of violence towards Heather. Carolyn Spence, Heather's mother, told police that Josh had threatened her daughter many times. Three years earlier, Josh had called Carolyn to say that he had tied Heather up, duct taped her mouth, and put her in the trunk of his car. He told Carolyn that it would be the last time she would hear her daughter's voice. He said he was going to dump her in the river where the alligators would eat her alive. Carolyn could hear Heather's voice in the background mumbling, as if her mouth was gagged. Josh quickly became a suspect in Heather's disappearance, the prime suspect, and police also thought the woman who was now eight months pregnant with Josh's child, Amelia Carr, might know something about what happened to Heather. It was hard to imagine that she had killed Heather while she was seven months pregnant, but it was too early to rule out any possibilities. Josh and Amelia were questioned at the Marion County Sheriff's Office. They were placed in rooms that were side by side. For the next couple of days, detectives interviewed them separately for hours over multiple sessions. They bounced back and forth between the two rooms, gathering information as they compared Josh and Amelia's stories. She said she wanted to get the hell out of Dodge. Want me to keep the kids, but when she gets it cleared up, she's coming home. And Heather always coming home. She always does, and I've always taken her back, but this time I'm not taking her back. At first, Amelia protected Josh and told the police that he would not hurt Heather. Do you, honestly, honestly, you think Josh is capable of doing something or would do something to her? Honestly, no. Why? I really don't, because in 11 years of all the crap they've been through. He's beat her ass in 11 years. Yeah. I have reports I like this where he has threatened her. He's beat her ass, and he's pulled a gun on her and Benjamin. And that's what he went to jail for. Okay? And that got tossed out. You know why he got tossed out? Why? Hmm? Because Josh's mom called Heather, threatening her. And Heather went and dropped charges. That's why that got tossed out. As police grew more skeptical of Amelia's story, she backed away from her original narrative. She indicated that she knew more and asked for immunity as a trade-off for providing information. Her defense for everything she had done so far was that she feared what Josh might do to her if she did not comply with his wishes. Sergeant Potter came to me and, and told me that you had some new information that you want to talk to me about. No one has promised you anything, correct? No one's coerced you in any way. 
This is all voluntary and your free will to talk to us. To me, correct? You understand that your rights still apply? Yeah. Okay. You gotta tell me the truth. From point A to Z. Okay. Tell me. In earlier interviews, Amelia had denied knowing anything about Heather's disappearance, but then she changed her story. In the last week and a half, this last week and a half, mm -hmm. things have been really tense. And every time I mentioned going home to my mom, he would tell me, I wouldn't do that. You're not going to take her. Heather took my kids from me. And I asked him, what are you talking about? And he told me, you don't want to come missing like she did. And then missing, he said she's in Mississippi. He goes, well, she's closer than you think. And we kind of got into it. And that's when he told me that. I don't know if he said he strangled or he choked her or whatever, but he said he did that and that he was in that back trailer. Now see, what I don't understand is when he told me that he killed her, I don't know where, I, but I know he had her in my mom's back trailer is what he told me. She wouldn't come there willingly. There's no way that girl would come How there. How would he get into that trailer? It doesn't lock. See, we store stuff back there, and the door, it doesn't lock, it doesn't which, even latch. Which door? The only one that we use, me and my mom, it's the closest one. With only a wall separating Josh and Amelia at the police station, they could sometimes hear each other's raised voices. At one point, the interview room camera captured Josh with his head pressed against the wall, trying to hear what Amelia was telling detectives. Some statements you have made. I'm telling you, if you want me to go down this road, it's not going to look pretty for you. You know, there's a lot of people that we're going to be talking to. Oh, no. Okay. And if there's something you need to tell me, this is the time to tell me right now. Oh, I'm hoping you guys find her. I mean... Well, we, we, we're going to find her. Find her with your help. <sighs> I mean, it'd be... With your help, we're going to find yeah. her. Okay? And okay. I need you to understand that. I need your I know. help. And I'm here to help. I mean, we've got kids who need both parents if you and know something this is the time this is our opportunity because you want to see that baby being born oh yeah you know what i mean okay yeah. you know you don't want something to bite you in the behind if you know something. <laughs> no. okay on february 15th the day that heather disappeared she finished her shift at the restaurant at 3 p.m and arrived home a half an hour later jamie was there but left soon after that was the last time he saw heather Josh told police that he picked up his kids at Heather's place later that day and took them to his mother's house. Then, that evening, around 8 p.m., he claimed he got a call from Heather asking him to bring $500 to her at the Petro station so she could leave town for a while. According to Josh, when he got there, she was waiting outside with a red-wheeled suitcase and a black duffel bag. She was wearing blue jeans and a gray t-shirt with a flag on it. But when police pulled video footage from the Petro station, Heather was nowhere to be seen. Video of what? Of, her, of Heather at that Petro on that date, all day, all night. A few days after Heather's disappearance, Jamie got a call from Josh. He said he was back together with Heather and that Jamie needed to move out, which he did the next day. Josh warned Jamie to never contact Heather again. Police still don't know if Heather had decided to leave town on her own or if something horrible had happened to her. As proof that her disappearance was voluntary, Josh showed detectives a letter his mother had typed up for him on the computer stating that Heather was giving her two children to him. He claimed it was Heather who signed it. Why? She didn't handwrite a letter. I don't know, man. I was saying, why she didn't look better exactly. typed out? Why did she handwrite a letter? But don't it look better typed out? Huh? Don't it look better when something's typed out instead of handwritten? No, actually looks better when it's handwritten. If it's coming from a oh, parent that says, I'm giving my child to Josh. I'm holding ass out of town. I want him to have full custody of this child. Well, I wish the hell I'd have had her done that then. I honestly do. I wish the hell that's what I'd have had her done. Who signed her name on that? She didn't. Mama signed her name? No. Heather signed her name? You signed her name? No. Heather signed her name? Your sister signed her name? No. Because you know we got handwriting analysis, right? Yeah. Okay, did you threaten her to sign her name? Man, come on now. This shit's not going too far. Huh? This is, no, I did not. You wanted them kids. 
You didn't want her to have it. No, I'm going to be honest with you, man. You didn't want her to You didn't want her She was sitting up there telling you. She was telling you. She was going to... You weren't going to never see them kids. No, she was not. No. No. She was Josh explained to the detectives that Heather believed there might be a warrant out for her arrest, so she wanted to skip town by herself until the heat died down. But everyone else who knew Heather insisted she would never abandon her children. Heather had taken off before to stay with family and friends in Mississippi, but she always brought her children with her. At first, Josh and Amelia vehemently denied any involvement in Heather's disappearance, but as law enforcement drilled down on their stories, the accounts provided by Josh and Amelia began to disintegrate. Amelia held out longer than Josh, but detectives picked apart her web of lies and started to suspect that she may have taken part in the murder. So all these things, and what, what do you think that you are guilty of then? I know what I'm guilty what do, you, what do you think it would be appropriate? But I just wish that you would take into consideration, but I was fucking scared. Tell me what you think you're guilty of. Of being a monster. I'm sorry? Of being a monster? And helping a monster. Oh, I, I didn't understand. Helping a monster. Oh, helping a monster. Yeah, I thought he was full of shit. And then when you get back, and you see the look in someone's eyes, and you are terrified for yourself because if he's doing that to her, what makes you think that if I... The terror is gone when he goes to jail. He's in jail and you're sitting there telling his sister that you're still trying to put it off on Jason and Jamie. You still, to this day, Because that's what she wanted to, to hear. That's not, that's not what she wanted to hear. That's she knew the truth. She wanted to hear the truth from you. There was no evidence that Josh had ever been violent towards Amelia before, and she told police that he had never hurt her like he did Heather. But as the detectives started drilling down on her story and finding inconsistencies, she maintained that she only lied because she was scared that Josh would hurt her if she didn't. Fear is not an issue with you. What do you mean? Fear has never been an issue with you. You have never been afraid of Josh before or after you guys took someone's life. Afraid he might leave you. No, I wasn't afraid of him leaving me because I left him. I left him. Do you understand me? Fear was not an issue. I was afraid to go against him. Amelia didn't only throw Josh under the bus. She insinuated that Jamie Acom and his friend Jason Lotshaw might have been the ones who killed Heather. She pointed a finger at anyone who might take the focus off of her. Jamie and Jason were brought in for questioning, but Amelia's plan to pin the murder on Jamie backfired when he informed detectives that he had witnessed Amelia attack Heather in January when he was living at Heather's place. Amelia had Heather's hair wrapped around her hand and like this and had the knife to her throat. Well, I had told her, don't do that. Whatever you're doing, you're tripping out. You overreacted. So they both calmed down. She told me to get Amelia and get her the hell out of her house. Jason Lotshaw cooperated with detectives just as Jamie did. He told them his suspicions when it came to Amelia. I'm going to tell you the truth. I've had a feeling the whole time since that girl came up missing that I had a feeling that Amelia had something to do with it. Jamie and Jason had good reason to wonder about Amelia. In their interviews, they independently told police a chilling story. While driving together in a truck, she had offered them $500 to get Heather drunk and to bring her to Amelia. She told them that she wanted to snap her neck. They thought it was a joke and laughed it off. Well, if I'm looking at it like this, let a jury look at it like this, where you you guys are in a triangle. Oh, that's a mess. You guys are in a triangle. I don't know if y'all all had relationships together, but that's your business if you did. But I'm getting rumors that you guys did. I can care less. Okay? Huh? I can care less. But I'm telling you, right now you guys are in a triangle. And look where it's at. Okay? You got him leading both of you guys on. You got him loving her more than he loves you. And I'm just being honest. He wants her. She don't want him. She want, he wants to take the kids, but he knows that's how. The only way he can financially support himself is having those kids. Because if she take the kids from him, 
You got to pay child support. Okay? Oh, I know about child support. He took her credit cards. Did he tell you that? I was under the impression that she left him because she was coming back. Mm -hmm. She's left and came back so many other times. No, 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 no. Police immediately arrested Josh. They had him on fraud charges for using Heather's credit card, but they didn't have enough evidence to hold Amelia. That amplified tension between the pair, and the police used that discomfort to their advantage. Being questioned in an interview room made Josh Jones for a cigarette. Detectives would not let him smoke in the interview room. They thought they could parlay his craving to their advantage, so they offered to take him outside to smoke and they kept a tape recorder running. What did me tell you? Did she get to go home? Mm-hmm. Yes, she did. How come she got to go home and I can't? Maybe she was a little bit more honest. See how that works. I'm going to tell you what this is what I was told. Right here. I was told she was gone to leave it alone. That's what I was told, that she's gone to leave it alone. Detective Bowie confronted Amelia with the tape recording of Josh blaming her for the murder. But what? Don't okay. do this to yourself. Ask my mom. I was home that night. Don't do this to night. yourself. What is he saying I did? That you set it up. Set what up though? It was getting late and everyone involved in the investigation was exhausted. Detectives decided to start the process of arresting Josh to put him in jail for the night with the intention of starting their interviews again in the following morning. But to their astonishment, just as Detective Bowie began to gather Josh's belongings, he had a sudden change of heart. Take him to jail. That's where you want to go, my man. That ain't where I want to go, man. I got no choice. You got no choice. I don't know what else to do. Or else you got to talk to You let me take that by my mama if I take you to We'll go right now. You take me to where Heather is, I'll take your wallet to your mom. You won't take me by and let me talk to mom? You take me to Heather first. And you take me by my mom? That's a promise. Let's go. All right, I want this shit off. Yeah, all this time. Can we stop getting back to Syria? Yes, we will. I'm in this shit on my own, man. Sergeant Spivey and Bowie scrambled to hit the road as fast as possible before Josh changed his mind. The three of them took off driving the 15 miles to Amelia's mother's home. Man, I'm gonna tell y'all this right now, man. I didn't do this shit. I ain't have it done, but I know it was done. Okay, and you can you're taking us to it. Right thing well, to I'm do. Told she was. It's the right thing to do, man. That night, Josh led police to Heather's grave. Detective Bowie stuck a stick in the ground and he felt it give way. He knew Heather was down there. Early the next morning, investigators returned to tackle the gruesome task of digging Heather out of the ground. Her body was so decomposed that only her left thumbprint was recognizable. 
Police took Amelia back to the scene of the murder, hoping she would slip up and say something to implicate herself. The ramshackle trailer at the back of her mother's property was crammed full of junk. came in here and I saw her on the chair and she was taped to it. I just kind of stopped for a minute. I didn't know what to think or what to do. And then I just went up to her and I was checking for a pulse. She didn't feel anything. I didn't feel anything. I just kind of looked at her. I started to cry. I didn't know what to do, what to think. I turned and we kind of started walking out. On the fourth day of the investigation, Josh sent word from the jailhouse that he wanted to speak to the detectives again. It was Saturday, so they had to come into the police station in casual street clothes. Both detectives are skeptical because they're sick and tired of getting a runaround from Josh and Amelia. But this time, Josh was ready to talk. Being locked up in jail loosened his lips. I tell Heather, that we're going over to Amelia's house. I hold the door open, Heather goes in, I come in behind her, and I'm like, Heather, listen, I want you to sit down so we can talk. And she's like, hell no, I'm out of here, and that's about the time Amelia walked in the door, and that's when she really started getting loud. I tried to grab a hold to her, and she jerked loose of me, so I let her go. She started down the hall, and that's when Amelia hit her in the head with that flashlight. And that's when Heather came back. I called her. I set her up in that chair. And that's when Amelia got the duct tape. And she taped Heather around here and through that. And I taped the bottom of Heather's legs up. And she put tape over Heather's mouth. We walked out the door so I could go home and get the kid. When I talked to Amelia on the phone, she told me, she said, it's done. She told me what she did with breath tape around that and held her nose for a little bit. And that's what choked her out. You did hand motions to show how the bag went over her head and the tape went around her neck. You did hand motions. You know why you did that? That's memory. Because you saw it. That's memory. You were there when she took her last breath. You were there when she died. Right or wrong? Right. No, 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 no. Right or wrong? Right. Josh tells the detectives that he and Amelia were in on this plot together. Their plan was to get Josh to lure Heather to Amelia's mom's property by asking her to be his lookout while he stole back $1,700 he had returned to Amelia, the money she had loaned him for his lawyer's bill. Was she fighting then? Well, she really couldn't, man. I I you know, I asked her a little bitty self. The adrenaline was flowing. And I just held her. I made a taper. her. She told me, she said, I'll leave y'all alone. And I made her say, well, you're, still, you're here with him now. You got in the car with him tonight. And she told her, I promise, I'll leave y'all alone. Let me go. And what did you say to her? Nothing. I don't think she said nothing enough to her at all. And when she put the bag over her head, she taped it around her neck to where it was solid on her. And she had her arm around her neck. She was trying to snap her neck. She had one, this hand right here was coming over her head, over her nose. And where were you? I was still sitting on her. And once I knew that Heather had got weak, I could tell she was getting weak because she was just like then nothing. She wasn't mm, like that no more. When the, because the tape was over her mouth, trying to say something. So she was mumbling at one point when the tape was over her mouth? She was trying to say something. I don't know what. And then after I got up, because she wasn't moving no more, I got up. When I got up, she, I guess I don't know whether it was nerves or what that made her legs push out, and the chair went back, and Emil was still behind her with her hand around her. She done tried to snap her neck, she couldn't. She done tried it, she couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. But she had her hand over her nose, through that, over that bag. And 
and I heard her make like a gurgling noise in her throat or something. Well, then y'all, after she she died, you guys took the tape off of her, and I pulled her down on the floor. I what? pulled her hair back out of her face, seen her eyes. I know it's fucked up now. I know you know that. I fucked around with her. She killed me. Josh admitted that jealousy played a big part in his decision to kill Heather. But when I first got her sent to the chair, I had asked her a couple of times. And that's really what got me. I went to jail on Tuesday. On a Friday, that Friday night of me and Jamie went over there. And I guess they, Jamie and Heather were drinking or whatever. I don't know. That's what Amelia told me. Mm -hmm. And she said to her and Jamie had sex three different times on the couch. And I asked Heather. And she told me, yeah. She came clean with me. And I said, three days after you put me in jail, you slept with somebody. She said, yeah. And that's, I lost it. I, I didn't care then. When it was over and Heather had stopped breathing, they peeled the tape from her body and pulled the bag off her head. They stuffed her in a black duffel bag, the same one Josh had falsely claimed he saw Heather with at the gas station. It was too small for her body, so her head stuck out. Josh couldn't bear to look at the face, so they covered the head with a blanket they found in the trailer. They hid her under a table in the trailer until Josh could come back the next day after work to bury her. He does a lot of digging in his job as a landscaper, so he dug the grave in just about 20 minutes. They found a board from the property and laid that over the body before covering her with dirt. They grabbed some things they found around the yard and piled them on top of the grave as well, springs from a mattress, an orange chair, and the remnants of a television. After his confession to police, Josh seemed relieved, like a weight had been lifted off him. He asked the detectives if he could call his mother. I need to talk to you, Mom. I want to talk to you. No, I don't need to talk to a lawyer, Mama. I'm guilty. No, I don't. I'm guilty. I done it, Mama. I didn't do it by myself. I didn't do it by myself, but I done it. I just got sick of it, Mama. I wanted my babies. I was just tired of her running off, keeping them from me. I was sick of it. Josh had detailed the horrific murder of Heather Strong. Detectives had his story, but they still didn't have much evidence against Amelia. It was Josh's word against hers. Luckily, they received a call from Josh's sister, Michelle, on Monday afternoon. She was upset that Josh was going to go down for a murder that he and Amelia had committed together. Why should she walk free? Michelle agreed to let police place a recording device in her vehicle while she met with Amelia. Sergeants Bowie and Spivey watched Michelle pick up Amelia and followed them around to a park. Police waited on the other side of a building and listened to the conversation using a monitoring device. Amelia told Michelle that as long as Josh stayed quiet, they could pin the murder on Jamie and Jason because they were already being scrutinized by the police. Amelia justified it by saying they both needed to stay out of prison for the sake of their kids. This is the man, it's Amelia. I mean, he's breaking my heart. He shouldn't be in there, and I'm telling you right now, I want the true story from you. You gotta tell me the truth so I can help you with the job. What do you think he's having, Sean? Please tell me inside. What did he tell you? And did he tell you over recorded phones? No. 
Please tell him just keep his mouth shut and to keep his head up because everything's going to be okay. I don't know when, but he's got to stop talking to them. So what is he going to do now? Because if he confesses to this, we both go down and we both lose our kids. So tell me what happened that night because three heads are better than two. Yeah. As hard as you think it is to give me details or that I can't handle it, it's what we're gonna have to do so that we can get story straight. When I got out there, he was talking to her. She tried to run for the door and she knocked me down. He tried to go back and he started to take her to the chair so she couldn't run. What happened next? He put the bag over her head. You tried to snap her neck, that didn't work. You did? Yeah. I was a freaking detective. Oh, crap. Uh-oh. Hey, how are you doing? Hey, your mama told us you were up here. Okay. Hey, can we talk to you for a second? Yeah. Amelia was transported back to the Marion County Sheriff's Office by the detectives. Almost a week after the first time they had interviewed Amelia, they decided to interrogate her again. And this time, they confront her with the secret surveillance recording from Michelle's car. Today, you had a conversation with Josh's sister. That conversation was recorded. You, out of your own mouth, admitted to being there. You used, you used some of the words that I just used. I waited in the house for a few minutes, just like I was told. There was a recorder in her car. There was a microphone in her car so we could listen to you. We didn't just stumble across that car sitting in the park. Yeah, no. Okay? We heard everything. Now... Let's go back to what I was just saying. You have shown no remorse. I'm not trying to be mean, but quite frankly so far, you have shown that you're acting like a cold-hearted, hateful person who killed the mother of two children, okay? Because I don't cry? No, because you sit right here stone cold and stare in that man's face and lie to his face. After you told that girl today, you tried to break her neck, and it didn't work. You now, that? Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. Remember those words? It came from whose mouth? Mm. But is that right that you were there with Josh when Heather took her last breath? I can't hear you. Detectives had finally cracked Amelia's shell of denial. She admitted that she was there when Heather died. Now it was time to coax her into demonstrating exactly what part she had played. Show me where you were standing at. If I'm her sitting in this chair, show me where you were standing at. Which time? The first time. The, the only time. It's okay, I trust you. Come on. Okay. When... How far back do you want me to go? When you were standing behind her trying After she was taped, and I put the bag over her head, and he taped it, and I pulled the tape, and he taped it, I made a little attempt because I was scared and I was shaking, and I told him I couldn't do it, I couldn't do it. How many times do you think you tried? Once or twice, and I just, I Once, couldn't... How many times twice. do you think you tried? Because I couldn't do it, and I told him, I was shaking so bad, I said, Josh, I can't do this, so then I stepped back. Okay. And he went around and he took care of it. But you tried right to snap then. her neck because you wanted it to be Because I was quick. scared. You wanted it to be quick. Yeah, I didn't want her to suffer. You didn't want her to suffer, so you tried to break her neck. And I couldn't do it because I was shaking so bad. So that I just stepped back and he took over. And he held his hand over her nose and her mouth so that she couldn't breathe. Only you and him know exactly yeah, I know. who did what because one's pointing at the other one. But both of you guys were there, present, assisting each other when she took her last breath. Correct? 
So even though I didn't kill him, we were Correct. charged with the same thing as him. Exactly. You don't think you deserve that? No, because I didn't kill her. <laughs> I really didn't. What was she saying to you? Hi. What was she saying? She had taped her mouth. What was she saying before her mouth was taped? Was there a reason she asked you not to do that to her? Sure. What did she say to you? Did she ever give a reason why she didn't want to be taped up or held down? Claustrophobic. His comment to her was, I was claustrophobic when you had me sitting in Mary County Jail for 31 effing days away from my kids. Was his comment to her? And that's something Josh didn't tell us. Josh and Amelia each had their own motivations for killing Heather Strong. Josh was sick of Heather leaving him, canoodling with other men and threatening to take away his children. And he was angry that her police complaint had landed him in jail, costing him money and his freedom. Amelia was about to give birth to Josh's baby, and although she denied it, detectives believed she was resentful that Josh preferred Heather over her. Both killers tried to assign the most horrific actions they inflicted on Heather to each other but they were both acting in tandem. So in the eyes of the law, they are equally responsible for her death. Amelia's trial happened first. The state sought the death penalty. In late 2010, she was convicted of first-degree murder and kidnapping. A jury voted for the death sentence. Amelia's family members tried to save her by testifying during the penalty phase of the trial about her past trauma that she had suffered they divulged that she had been sexually abused by her grandfather and father starting at age four. In 2004, Amelia's father was sentenced to 48 months in prison for attempting to hire a hitman on his wife and two of his daughters, including Amelia, to prevent them from testifying against him. But the jury was not moved by Amelia's troubled past. They voted seven to five to put her to death by lethal injection. A judge accepted that decision, and she was sent to death row at the Lowell Correctional Institute in Ocala. The state of Florida was also seeking the death penalty for Josh. His case went on trial in 2012. He was convicted of kidnapping and first-degree murder. Even though Amelia and Josh killed Heather together, Josh's jury was more lenient. They voted 8-4 to four to sentence him to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Although Amelia had callously taken a life, she didn't want to lose hers. She and her lawyers fought hard for years to get the death sentence overturned. In 2017, she was resentenced to life without the possibility of parole after a 2016 Florida Supreme Court ruling that required a jury to be unanimous when recommending death for a judge to consider imposing the death sentence. Four months after killing Heather, Josh wrote a letter to Heather's mother, Carolyn Spence, asking her to take care of his kids. He talked about the trauma that they would endure in their lives. He said that he still loved Heather and that he had hoped to get the death penalty for murdering her. While the police were investigating this case, he tried to hang himself in jail when his kids were taken into state custody. There is an unfortunate and unsettling note to the end of this story. Donald Bowie, the police officer who took the lead in interviewing Heather's killers, was known for being a tenacious cop who had a knack for getting into suspects' heads. But a decade later, he faced his own legal troubles. In 2019, Bowie pled guilty to committing domestic violence against a woman. He had inflicted both battery and strangulation on the victim. Home security videos supported the woman's allegations. He was sentenced to five years of probation and ordered not to have any contact with the victim. He was required to complete a batterer's intervention program and counseling sessions. He was also forced to forfeit his law enforcement certifications. If you found this case compelling, don't forget to like the video, comment down below and give us your take on it, and please subscribe to the channel. We're on our way to a million and we'd love to have you along. Also hit the notification bell to stay up to date when we reveal a new shocking case.
Until next time, stay safe and keep your eyes peeled. You never know what's lurking in the shadows.